4. A warm wind on the mountain and the sky darkening, the clouds looping black underbellies until a huge ulcer folded out of the mass and a crack like the earth's core rending rattled panes from Winkle Hollow to Bay's Mountain. And the wind rising and gone colder until the trees bent as if borne forward on some violent acceleration of the earth's turning. And then that too ceased. And with a clatter and hiss out of the still air, a plague of ice. The old man looked out through a veil of water fringing his hat brim, beadwork swinging as he turned his head. The hail had stopped and the wind was coming up again with the rain. He had set forth from his refuge under the clay bank and already he was wet through. The road had gone from dust chocked up in dark water balls to geysers of erupting mud, the sluggish flow beginning in the wheel ruts and blistering under the rain. The old man began to run, hobbling in an odd bandy-legged progress through the blinding rain, great wind-blown sheets of it sweeping over the road. The air was filled with branches and foliage of trees, and the trees whipped and cracked. By the time he left the road and entered the woods, they were coming down, the dead and leafless trunks, grasping with brittle gray fingers and going prone on the earth with the muffled thunder of their fall, half lost in the fulminations overhead. The old man kept to his course, over last year's leaves slick with water, hopping and dancing wildly among the maelstrom of riotous greenery like some rain sprite, burned out of the near darkness in antic configuration against the quick bloom of the lightning. As he passed it thus, a barren chestnut silver under the sluice of rain erupted to the heart and spewed out sawdust and scorched mice upon him. A slab fell away with a long hiss like a burning mast tilted seaward. He is down. A clash of shields rings, and Valkyrie descend with cat's cries to bear him away. Already a rivulet is packing clay in one ragged cuff, and a quiff of white hair depending from his forelock reddens in the seeping mud. Rainwater seeped among the porous boards of the outhouse until the wind road leaves in the cat's corner were black and lifeless, and the cat left through the leaning door to seek new shelter. Pools of black water stood in the path, swirling slowly their rack of straw and weeds. Armadillo beetles coiled round a shot and strangely buoyant. She skirted them on wincing feet, bore squeamishly the wet slide of last year's limp and slime-brown weeds. Arthur Ownby's hound rooted and burrowed in his wad of ripe sacks, slept again, his tail clasped to his hairless stomach. He did not see the cat that came to the door of his cellar and stood on three legs. Such light as there was to announce the new day filtered thinly through a mizzle of rain and remarked the fluff of her taupe fur curled in a cleft tree bowl on the south slope of Red Mountain. Hunger drove her out in the late afternoon, cautious, furtive, dusted with wood rot. Still the rain, eating at the roads, cutting gullies on the hills till they ran red and livid as open wounds. The creek came up into the fields, a river of mud questing among the honeysuckles. Fence posts like the soldiers of Pharaoh marched from sight into the flooded draws. In Saunders Field, a shallow marsh, calm and tractable beneath the dimpling rain. And yet rain. What low place did not hold water? At the little end of McCall's pond, water fell thunderously into the sinkhole that drained it. Along Little River, the flats stood weed-deep in liver-colored water flecked with thatches of small driftwood and foam that coiled and spun near imperceptibly, or rocked with the wind riffles passing under them. By day, flocks of rails gathered. A pair of bitterns stalked with gimlet eyes the fertile shallows. At night, the tidelands rang with peepers, with frogs gruffly coral. Great scaly gars from the river invaded the flats, fierce and primitive of aspect, long beaks full of teeth. Ancient fishes survived unchanged from Mesozoic fens. Their yellowed boneless skeletons graced the cracked clay beds later in the season, where the water left them to what querulous harridans, fish crow or buzzard, might come to glean their frames, the smelly marvel of small boys. Rafts of leaves descended the flowage of Henderson Valley Road, clear water wrinkling over the black asphalt. The mud-choked gullies ran thick with water of a violent red, roiling heavily, pounding in the gutters with great belching sounds. The cat trod the high crown of the road, bedraggled and diminutive, a hunted look about her. A low sun fired the pine knots in the smokehouse wall till they glowed like rubies, veined and pupiled eyes, peering in at the gloom where the cat gnawed a dangling side of pork ribs. The salt drew her mouth, but she kept at it, pausing now and again to listen at the silence. Mildred Ratner's mule slippers carried her with care past the bad spots in the mud, chancing rather the dampness of the ragged grass that grew along the path. But with a pat of rain on the tar paper overhead, 
The cat heard nothing until the keys jangled just beyond the door and the lock rattled. She leapt to a high shelf, poised, sprang again, making for the air vent under the peaked roof. As the door let in, she was hanging by one toenail from this opening, hind claws flailing desperately for purchase, and then a sliver of the molding wood gave way and she lost her grip. When Mildred Ratner swung open the door and stepped into the smokehouse, she saw a cat drop with an anguished squall from somewhere overhead, land spraddle-legged facing her and make a wild lunge at her, teeth gleaming in the dimness and eyes incandesced with madness. She screamed and fell backwards, and the cat, with a long despairing wail, flowed over her and was gone. In Tipton's field, four crows sat in a black locust, ranged upon the barren limbs with heads low between their wing blades, surveying the silver-gray desolation, the silent rain in the country. They watched the cat come across the field at a slow lope, an erratic dancing progress where she veered and leapt, keeping to the spotty dry ground. Their calls in the afternoon stillness had a somber loneliness about them, the mournful quality of freight whistles. They came from the roost and defiled low over her head, dipping and swooping. The cat spun low on her haunches, battered at them. So did they harry her out of the field, her pausing at each attack to make a stand and grapple at the wind of their passage, hard-pressed to preserve dignity, the birds flaring, wheeling, setting to again in high crude humor. They left her at the bank of the creek to return, settle with treading wings among the locust branches. She marked them down, her yellow eyes narrowed in contempt, turned downstream and followed the swollen creek to the bridge. Here she crossed and continued taking the high wooded ground on the south bank, pausing here and there with random inquisitiveness at holes and hollow logs to smell, shake herself or lick the water from her chest, until a strong odor of mink musk brought her to the creek proper again. The mink was dead, swaying in the shore currents among the swamped and flaring grass. She crept to it on cocked legs, leapt to a mud hummock and swatted it with a long reach downward. She stood up and watched it. It bobbed lifelessly. The chain was hung on a stob somewhere out in the water, and when she hooked her claws into the mink to pull it toward her, it did not come. Finally, she ventured one foot into the water and bit into the neck of the animal. The grit impregnated in its fur set her teeth on edge, and she attacked it savagely, then stopped suddenly as if her attention had wandered or returned to something of importance which she had forgotten. She left the mink and set a course across the fields toward the pike road. The rain had plastered down her fur, and she looked very thin and forlorn. She gathered burdock and the curling purple leaves of rabbit weed as she went. A dead stalk of blackberry briar clung to her hind leg. Just short of the road, she stopped, shivered her loose skin, ears flat against her head. She squalled once, hugging the ground with her belly, eyes turned upward at the colorless sky, the endless pelting rain. On the afternoon of the third day, the rain slacked, and through the high pall of faint gray, Blades of light swung like far beacons, cutting slowly the wisped cloud edges, lace tatter or swirl of sea mist. Dark fell early, and later as he lay quilted and awake in his black loft, the rainless silence of the roof seemed to measure time, something lying in wait. He had already decided to go to the creek in the morning. The water might even have fallen some. So it was the morning of the fourth day before he went to his traps again, passing the pond and skirting the lower end where it flared out into the field with the weeds standing in the water like rice. Then down along the limestone ledges, past the hail-shattered floats of water lilies, shoals of new green leaves, on across the field and out to the road. Before he came to the bridge, he left the road, turned down a steep bank and crossed a fence, following a mud path until he came out on the creek bank. It had not fallen any. Troughs of clayey water rocked through the shallow field on the far side, seething in the matted honeysuckle the tops of milkweeds and willow shoots quivering in the pull of it. The creek itself was a royally misshapen flume, more like solid earth in motion than any liquid. Cutting past him, each dip and riffle, eddy, glide, uncurling rope coil fixed and changeless, and only the slight oily tremor of the water and the rush of noise testifying to motion at all. Unless a limb or stick came down, or here, a fluted belt of water curling upward in a long scoop like a snarled lip, broken suddenly by a tree branch lashing out of the perfect opacity of it, rapid and deft as a snake striking, subsiding again and invisible with no ring or ripple to trace it by. He sat down for a few minutes and watched it all. A kingfisher came up the creek, tacking back and forth, saw the boy and flared, veered away over the watery fields, trailing in the morning quiet his high staccato call. 
He got up and started along the path over the shelf of woods between the creek and the mountain, by hickories feathered in mist, by cottonwoods still coldly skeletal for all the new green of the spring. He began to climb, his approach forewarned by the patter of nut hulls, a dipping branch, scrabble of small feet on bark. He crossed the spine of the ridge and started down, seeing the horseshoe bend of the creek below him distended with blisters of brown water, spread out into the fields. Down the slope to the creek again, a shortcut he took who measured only horizontal travel. He couldn't find it. The creek was none that he had ever seen before, and when he turned his back to it at what looked like a place he knew, he was surprised to see a draw, a fence corner, a stand of locust oddly mislocated. He passed the place and came back. He had been too far down. He hurried along upstream for another fifty yards and then stopped short. The rock where his trap had been was submerged but a dome of water rose over it, and now he saw the wire reaching up to the sapling on the opposite bank. Just above here the creek narrowed. It was the place where he usually crossed on a long and mossy pier of stone. That too lost now beneath the flood waters. In the narrows the current leaped in a slick chute, plummeted into the pool below, churning a chocolate dark foam and spreading again, a hissing sheet of flecks and bubbles, small twigs, bark and debris. A naked and swollen young bird turned up its round white belly briefly, rolled and folded into the thick brown liquid like a slowly closing eye, and below the rock something roiled darkly to the surface, sank again, as if struggling with some unseen assailant. He watched. A moment later it flared again, and he could make it out better, the hair floating undulant as black grass racked in the eddies. He looked along the bank until he found a stick, came back and leaned on tiptoes out over the water, poking. He found the ledge of rock tested along it with his stick and then stepped out, panicky for a moment as his foot sank. Then he was straddle-legged with one foot on the bank and the other in the creek, the water boiling between his legs, ribboning high on his calf. He got the other foot down and turned, carefully facing upstream, standing with the thin brown wings of water flying over his shins with a slicing sound, standing so in an illusion of fantastic motion. He worked his way crabwise to within a yard of the other bank, to the channel where the rocks terminated, launched out wildly across the remaining stretch of water. He went in nearly to his waist, his feet chopping rapidly at the slick and steep-pitched mud, flailing mightily with his stick before he could get a proper foothold. Then he was across, pulling himself up the bank by what roots or weeds would hold his weight, cold and mud-slavered. He hobbled down to where the sapling was and slid down the bank to it, catching himself with one foot against the slender trunk, took hold of the wire and undid it the wire humming electrically in his hand, took a good grip on it and climbed the bank again, pulling it after him. When he got to the top and turned around, he could see his catch floating in the grass, and even before he pulled it up to him, he could see the white places on it like hanging leeches. Then he had it in his hand, feeling the fur gritty with mud, the cusp bone end jutting from the foreleg wrecked between the jaws of the trap, the white bib smeared with clay and the fine yellow teeth bared in a fierce grin and turning it slowly in his hand, studying dumbly the clean, ugly slits, white and livid, wounds but like naked eyelids or dead mouths gaping. He took it from the trap and put it in his pocket, wound the wire around the trap and put that in the other pocket. The sun was well up, but already the promised light was drowned in a sweep of wet clouds rolling and building darkly to the southeast. He did not recross the creek, but headed out into the field. Before he reached the woods, the first drops of rain had already spattered his shoulder. When he got to the road, it was black and slick with water, and he hunched his shoulders forward against the mounting downpour, shivering a little. Sheets of spray gusted over the smoking road and over the swamp land, the houses standing bleak and gray. A final desolation seemed to come, as if on the tail of the earth's last winter a well of water were rising slowly up through the very universe itself. It had been raining for six days steady, when Marion Silder finally left the house. He came down the drive sideways, slewing sheets of mud from under the cavorting wheels, got straightened out on the road and drove to the forks. A small pond had formed in front of the store, and customers were obliged to tread a plank walk to get to the porch. The rain had settled into a patient drizzle, and the people of Red Branch sat around their stoves, looked out from time to time at the gray, wet country, and shook their heads. Silder backed his car up to the gas pump and got out sloshing the mud from his boots in the puddle, waded to the porch and went in. There was a mesh of welding rod over the front windows now, and he smiled a little at that. Mr. Eller looked up from his chair by the meat block. 
Well, he said, I ain't seen you for a while. Bring some money with you? Silder ignored that. Gas, he said. Where's the keys? Mr. Eller sighed and rose from his chair, went to the cash register, rang open the drawer, handed the keys across the counter. Hope you don't care to wade, he said. Silder took the keys and went out to the pump. He unlocked it and began cranking the lever, pumping gas up into the glass bowl at the top of the rusty orange tank. When he had it full, he unscrewed the cap from the fender, let in the hose, and depressed the lever. The gas in the bowl surged and bubbled, sluiced into the tank of the car. After the bowl emptied, it remained beaded on the inside, a greasy look to it. Silder didn't notice. He rehung the hose and locked the pump, waded back to the porch and inside to give the keys to Mr. Eller. A loose box of kittens came tottering aimlessly over the floor, rocking on their stub legs and mewling. Their eyes were closed and festered with mucus as if they might have been struck simultaneously with some biblical blight. Them's the nastiest-looking cats I ever did see, Silder said. That's what Mrs. Fenner said, droned the storekeeper. Young Pulliam told her she ought to see the ones back in the back propped up with sticks. He picked the keys up off the counter and rang them back in the cash drawer again. Put it on the bill, Silder said. Seems like they ought to be a hand sign for that, Mr. Eller said. Like for a howdy or a we'll see you. Save a lot of talk in here. If I had your money, I'd retire for life. It'd pay about the same. Sure it would, Silder said. Seems to me like, Mr. Eller began. Never mind, Silder said. I got to get on. Poor folks don't have time to stand around jawing all day. He waved and went out, stopped at the door a minute and looked back. Say, he called. What's that? A Christian have drowned him. What's that? Mr. Eller asked again. Leaning in the door and grinning, Silder pointed at the kittens bobbing over the floor like blown lint. Mr. Eller shooed his hand at him, and he left. The storekeeper drummed his nails on the marble ledge of the cash register for a minute. Then he turned and went back to his chair. He had been resting for only a short time when the clock among the canned goods began a laborious unwinding sound, as if about to expire violently in a jangle of wheels and leaping springs. Stopped, told off four doom-like gongs evocative of some oriental call to temple, then hushed altogether. Mr. Eller stirred from his chair, went to the clock, and wound it with a key hanging down from a string. It made a loud ratcheting noise. Then he seized it from the shelf and slammed it back. It set up once more a low wooden ticking. One of the cats had wandered behind the meat block, and on his return to the chair, he stepped over it carefully. It went by in a drunken reel. Caromed off the meat case, continued. Lost, they wandered about the floor, passing and repassing each other unseen. One staggered past a coffee can set next to the stove, slipped, fell in the puddle of tobacco spittle surrounding it. He struggled to his feet again. Back and side, brown, slimed, and sticky. Tottered across to the wall where he stood with blind and suppurant eyes and offered up to the world his thin wails. Mr. Eller dozed and his head rocked in small increments down his shoulder, onto his chest. After a while, a little girl in a thin and dirty dress came through the door behind the counter and gathered up all the kittens now wailing louder and in broken chorus, carried them out again, talking to them in low remonstrances. Mr. Eller dozed, the clock ticked. The flypaper evolved in slow spirals. The wind had come up again, and the rainwater blown from the trees pattered across the tin roof of the store, muffled and distant sounding through the wallboard ceiling. Silder closed the gate behind him and started up the orchard road. It was guttered and channeled, and sluices of water still seeped along the myriad mud deltas that filled the flats between the inclines. The car slewed giddily on the turns, bogged finally to a frantic stop skittering quarterwise like a nervous horse, and the rear wheels unwinding thick ropes of mud that broke and shot precipitately across the low hem of brush, and on into the woods, where they slapped up against the trees with a sound oddly hollow. Silder cut the motor and stepped out into the bright mud. It was a quarter mile to the turnaround, and he started straight away, his leather boots sucking. There were apples on the trees the size of a thumbnail, and green with a lucent and fiery green, deathly green as the bellies of bottle flies. He plucked one down in passing and bit into it, venomously bitter, drew his mouth like a persimmon. If green apples made you sick, Silder reflected, he would have been dead long ago. Most people he knew could eat them. Didn't take poison ivy, either. The boy, John Wesley, he was bad about poison ivy. Bad blood. 
It took him until dark to get done, joggling the cases two at a time back down the road, nine trips in all. When he had stacked the last two cases in the turtle, he locked it and, opening the door of the car, sat down and took off his boots, shapeless with mud, and stood them on the floor just behind the front seat. He got the car rocked loose and then had to back down for almost half a mile before he could find a place that looked wide and solid enough to turn around in. By the time he got out on the pike, a wind had come up and small spits of rain were breaking on the glass. He propped his left sock foot on the handbrake and drove leisurely down the mountain. The lights of the city hovered in a nimbus and again stood fractured in the Black River. Isinglass image, tangled broken shapes. The shapeless splash of lights along the bridge walk following the elliptic and receding rows of pole lamps across to meet them. The rhythmic arc of the wipers on the glass lulled him and he coasted out onto the bridge, into the city, shrouded in rain and silence, the cars passing him slowly, their headlamps wan, watery lights in sorrowful progression. Silder's motor spat and jerked, caught again for a handful of revolutions, died with a spastic sucking noise. He let in the clutch and coasted for a minute, engaged it again. The motor bucked and the car shuddered violently and came to a stop. He sat at the wheel of the motionless car for a minute or two before he tried the starter, it cranked cheerfully, caught and sputtered once or twice without ever running. He flipped the switch off, reached a flashlight from the glove compartment, took a deep breath and surged wildly out into the rain. Waist deep in the engine compartment with the upturned hood sheltering him like the maw of some benevolent monster, he checked the wiring, the throttle linkages. Then he removed the float bowl from the fuel pump, held the flashlight up to the glass and looked at it. The liquid in it was a pale yellow. He poured it out and replaced the bowl, dropped the hood, and got back in the car. He had to crank the engine for some time before the bowl filled again, and then the motor caught and he engaged the gears. He drove along cautiously, listening. The street lamps passed bleary whorls along the window. There was no more traffic. Before he got to the end of the bridge, the motor rattled and died again. The old man awoke to darkness and water running, trickling and coursing beneath the leaves, and the rain very soft and very steady. The hound was lying with its head on crossed forepaws watching him. He reached out one hand and touched it, and the dog rose clumsily and sniffed at his hand. The wind had died, and the night woods in their faintly breathing quietude held no sound but the kind rainfall, track of water beads on a branch, their measured fall in a leaf pool. With grass in his mouth, the old man sat up and peered about him, heard the rain mendicant voiced, soft chanting in that dark grammary that summons the earth to bridehood. They came three times for the old man. At first it was just the sheriff and Gifford. They were one foot up the porch steps when he swung the door open and threw down on them and they could see the mule ears of the old shotgun laid back viciously along the locks. They turned and went back down the yard, not saying anything or even looking back, and the old man closed the door behind them. The second time they pulled up in the curve of the road with three deputies and a county officer. The old man watched them from his window, darting and skulking among the bushes, slipping from tree to tree like boys playing Indians. After a while, when everyone was set, the sheriff called from his place under the bank of the road. Come out with your hands up, Ownby. We got you surrounded. The old man never even turned his head. He was in the kitchen with the shotgun propped over the back of the chair, and he was watching one of the deputies hunkered up under a lilac bush in the west corner of the lot. The old man kept watching him. And then the sheriff called out again for him to surrender, and somebody shot out a window glass in the front room. So he didn't wait any more, but pulled the stock in against his cheek and cut down on the deputy. The man came up out of the bushes like a rabbit and hopped away toward the road with a curious loping gait, holding the side of his leg. He'd expected the man to yell, and he didn't. But then the old man remembered that he hadn't yelled either. The kitchen glass exploded in on him then, and he got behind the stove. There was a cannonade of shots from the woods, and he sat there on the floor listening to it and to the spat-spat of the bullets passing through the house. Little blooms of yellow wood kept popping out on the planks, and almost simultaneously would be the sound of the bullet and the boards on the other side of the room. They did not whine as they passed through. The old man sat very still on the floor. One shot struck the stove behind him and leaped off with an angry spang, taking the glass out of the table lamp. It was like being in a room full of invisible and malevolent spirits. He had the shotgun across his knees, broken, still holding the empty shell in his hand. The firing died in a few minutes, and he crawled along the cupboard and got his shells off the table and came back and reloaded the empty chamber. 
Then he rolled a cigarette. He could hear them calling to one another. Someone wanted to know if anyone was hurt. Then the sheriff told them to hold up a minute. That old bastard hadn't shot since the first time. And hollered loud as if a person couldn't hear him anyway, wanting to know if Ownby was ready to come out now. The old man lit his cigarette and took a deep pull. Outside, all was silence. Ownby, the sheriff called. Come out if you're able. There was more silence, and finally he heard some voices, and after that they fired a few more rounds. The stick propping up the glassless window leaped out on the floor, and the window dropped shut. He could hear the bits of lead hopping about in the front room, chopping up the furniture and scuttling off through the walls and rafters like vermin. They stopped, and the sheriff was talking again. Spread out, he was saying. Keep under cover as much as you can, and remember, everybody goes together. That didn't make much sense to the old man. He pulled twice more on his cigarette and put it out and crawled under the stove. Through a split board, he could see them coming, looking squat above the grass from his low position. Two deputies were moving down from the south end with drawn pistols. One of them was dressed in khakis and looked like an ATU agent. The old man marked their position, wiggled back out from under the stove, reposted to the window, and shot them both in quick succession, aiming low. Then he ducked back to his stove, broke the shotgun, extracted the shells, and reloaded. No sound from outside. The sheriff did not call again, and after a while, when he heard the car starting, he got up and went to the front room to see what they'd shot up. Toward late afternoon, it began to rain again, but the old man couldn't wait any longer. Black clouds were moving over the mountain, shading the sharp green of it, and in the coombs, horsetails of mist clung or lifted under the wind to lace and curl wistfully, break and trail across the lower slopes. A yellow hammer crossed the yard to his high hole in the jagged top of a lightning-wrecked pine, under wings dipping bright chrome. The old man carried out the last of his things and piled them on the sledge, buckled them down with the harness straps he had nailed under the sides. He went back in one more time and looked around. Some last thing he could save. He came out at length with a small hooked rug, shook the dust from it and put it over the top of the sledge. He took up the rope and pulled the sledge to the road and called for Scout. The old dog came from under the porch, peering with blue, roomy eyes at his indistinct world of shapes. The old man called again, and the dog started for the road, hobbling stiffly, and they set out together, south along the road, until they were faint and pale shapes in the rain. So when they came for the old man the third time, he was not there. They lobbed tear gas bombs through the windows and stormed the ruined house from three sides, and the house jerked and quivered visibly under their gunfire. The county officer was wounded in the neck. He sat on the muddy ground with the blood running down his shirt front, crying, and calling out to the others to get the dirty son of a bitch. When they came back out of the house, no one would look at him. Finally, the sheriff and another man came to where he was and helped him up and took him to the car. No, the sheriff said. He got away. Got away? How could he get away? The man asked two or three times, but the sheriff just shook his head, and after that the man didn't ask any more. They left in a spray of mud, four cars of them, with sirens going. When the old man came out upon the railroad, the rain had moved off the mountain, and in the last light, under the brim of the clouds, he could see the long, sharp ridges like lean, burning hounds racing down the land to the land's end westward, hard upon the veering sun. He turned his back to them, going east on the rail bed, the sledge rocking over the moldering ties. It was still raining, and dark was coming on fast. From time to time, he stopped to check his load and cinched the harness straps up. For two hours, he followed the tracks, down out of the darkening fields, through cuts where night fell on the high banks and fell upon the honeysuckle, drawing shadow forms there, grotesques, shapes of creatures mythical or extinct, and silently noting his passage. The old man bent east along the tracks, leaning into the rope, into the rich purple dusk. By full dark, he had left the tracks and turned into the woods to the south, feeling out the path with his feet, shivering a little now in his wet clothes. They came past the old quarry, the tiered and graceless monoliths of rock alienated up out of the earth and blasted into ponderous symmetry, leaning their fluted faces pale and recumbent among the trees like old temple ruins. They went silently along over the trace of the quarry road, the sledge whispering, the gaunt dog padding, past the quarry hole with its vaporous green waters and into the woods again, the limestone white against the dark earth a populace of monstrous slugs dormant in a carbon forest, 
groups of trees turned slowly like masted carousels, blending shadows and parting in darkness and wonder. The rain stopped falling. They passed, leaving a trail of foxfire shuffled up out of the wet leaves like stars plowed in a ship's wake. Morning found them on the south slope of Chilowe Mountain. The dog buckled down on top of the sledge now, and the old man pulling them tree by tree up the steep and final rise. From his high place on the slope, he could see the first straw-colored light sourceless beyond the Earth's curve, the horizon warped in a glaucous haze. An hour later, and they had gained the crest of the mountain and stood in a field of broom sedge bright as wheat, treeless but for a broken chestnut the color of stone. The sun was up by then, and the old man rested, leaning against a tree. After a while, he fell asleep, the sledge's painter still wrapped in his blistered hand. The dog stretched out in the sun, too, wrinkling his ragged hide at the flies. Far below them, shades of cloud moved up the valley floor like water flowing, darkened the quilted purlieus, moved on, the brushed land gone green and umber once again. The clouds broke against the mountain, coral-edged and bent to the blue curve of the sky. A butterfly struggled, down through shells of light, down to the gold and sea-green treetips. The old man came awake late in the afternoon and ate some cold cornbread, sharing it with the hound. He did not eat much, and the cornbread was enough. Then he started down the mountain, trucking behind him his sorry chattel, picking a course through the small trees and laurel jungles. Sometime after midnight he came out on a road and turned south along it, crossed a wooden bridge, a purling clear water stream, climbed with the road into the mountains again, the sledge drifting easily behind him and the hound plodding. The light at the house the old man came to that morning he could see a good while before he got to it. He caught glimpses of it once or twice somewhere on the ridge above him as he was coming through a mountain meadow, a huge pool in the darkness swept with the passing shadows of night birds. But he had no way of knowing that the road would take him there. He didn't see the light again until he topped the hill where the house stood and where a section of road was banded out of the night in a tunnel of car lights. Some men were talking, and he could hear the sound of the motor running. He kept on, into the light. The voices stopped. The old man looked up at them, two men leaning against the side of the automobile, another seated inside. He didn't stop. They faded behind the glare of the headlights, reappeared filmily, not moving, watching him. With the lights out of his eyes, the old man stopped and nodded to them. Howdy, he said. You ain't lost, are you? Don't reckon, he said. One of them said something. The car eased down the drive, the two men walking alongside. The man in the car leaned out toward him. This road don't go through, he said. It just loops and comes on back. How far is it to the hurricane? The old man wanted to know. The man turned out the lights. The other two had come up now and said, Howdy, each in turn. Scout clambered up onto the sledge and eyed them balefully. Wants to know how far is it to the hurricane? The driver said. What fur? The other one stepped forward and eyed the old man with bland curiosity, the sledge heaped with his worthless paraphernalia and topped by the prone and wasted hound. You can't hardly get there from here, he said. You ought to have come through sunshine, crossed the river there. It ain't easy to get to from nowhere, but that there'd have been a nigher cut. What you aim to do in there, cut timber? No, said the old man. Just fixing to put up some kind of a piece of a house and kindly settle there. In the hurricane? Yes, sir. Where are you from? The man in the car wanted to know. From towards Knoxville? The man in the car was silent for a minute. Then he said, I'm going into Sevierville here in just a minute. I can carry you that fur if you don't care to ride in an old beat-up car such as it is. Much obliged, the old man said. But I reckon I'll just get on. Well, the man said. He turned to the other two. I got to get myself, he said. We'll see you. They nodded. You come back. The car eased away, the lights coming on again, rattled out of sight down the road. The old man had the sledge rope in hand and was saying a goodbye to the men. You best come on in and have some breakfast with us, one of them said. Much obliged, the old man said. But I reckon I'll just be getting on. Might as well eat some with us, the other said. We just fixin' to. Well, the old man said. If you all don't care. The house the old man entered that morning was no shotgun shack, 
but a mountain cabin of squared logs rent deeply with weather checks and chinked with clay. It was long and saddle-bowed, divided into two rooms of equal size, and at the far end of one, a fireplace of river rock, rocks tumbled smooth as eggs, more ancient than the river itself. From a door to the right, a woman's face peered at them furtively as they sat, the taller of the men motioning the old man to a chair cut from a butter tub and patted in hair-worn cowhide. They produced tobacco and papers and passed them to him not ceremoniously, but with that deprecatory gesture of humility which country people confer in a look, a lift of the hand. The old man began to feel right homey. Say you from towards Knoxville, the tall man said. Yes, sir, he answered, taping down the paper of his cigarette. I got a sister lives over that way. Meanest kids I ever seen. Married a boy from Meade's Quarry. You know where that's at? Sure, the old man said. I come from Red Mountain my own self. We used to whoop Meade's Quarry boys of a Sunday afternoon just to keep a hand in. The man grinned. That's what he told me about you all, he said. Then the old man grinned. The other one broke in. Don't reckon you'd care for a little drink this early of a morning? Not less than you fellers is fixin' to have one. He disappeared through the door into the lean-to and presently came back with a mason jar. Let's see if this here is the one I wanted, he said, tilting it, watching the slow-rising chain of beads. He took off the cap and stretched a draft down his lean-corded neck, swallowed deep, cocked his head in a listening attitude, then passed the jar to the old man. That's the one, he said. The old man accepted the jar and took a good drink. His legs were beginning to feel a little heavy, and he lifted first one and then the other, slightly testing their weight. He raised the jar again, drank, and handed it back to the man. Now that's a right nice little whiskey, he said. The two men relayed the jar between them, and then it was capped and set on the floor. The shorter man was looking out the tiny window. Get in daylight, he said. He turned to the old man. You get a right early start, don't you? The old man recrossed his legs, taking a look out himself. Well, he said, kindly early, yes. You come up from Wallen this morning, I reckon? No, the old man said. Knoxville. I mean on foot, coming up the mountain. I come straight across, the old man said. They looked at each other. The tall one hesitated a moment, then he said, You say you go into the Harrikin? Aim to, the old man said. Can't say as it seems like much of a place to just go to, he said. I've knowed one or two people at different times what was there, and would have given some to have been away from it, though. Daddy, I remember, would leave dogs treed there of a night rather than go in after them. He said they was places you could walk for half a mile without ever setting foot to the ground, just over laurel hills and down timber, and a rattlesnake to the log. I never been there myself. You aiming to stay there long? The other one asked. But before the old man could answer that, the woman thrust her face through the door and announced breakfast. Both men rose instantly and started for the kitchen, then paused, remembering the old man still seated with the slow words forming on his lips. They had the uneasy look of boys sneaking to table with dirty hands. The old man stood and walked between them, the shorter one smiling a sort of half-smile and saying, I reckon we just about forgot how to act, ain't we? Pshaw, sure, said the old man. At the foot of the mountain, the old man found himself in a broad glade grown thick with rushes, a small stream looping placidly over shallow sands stippled with dace shadows, the six-pointed stars of skating water spiders drifting like bright, frail medusas. He squatted and dipped a palmful of water to his lips, watched the dace drift and shimmer. Scout waded past him, elbow deep into the stream, lapped at it noisily. Strings of red dirt receded from his balding hocks, marbling in the water like blood. The dace skittered into the channel and a water snake uncurled from a rock at the far bank and glided down the slight current, no more demonstrative of effort or motion than a flute note. The old man drank and then leaned back against the sledge. The glade hummed softly. A wood hen called from the timber on the mountain, and to that sound of all summer days of seclusion and peace, the old man slept. Yes, sir, the storekeeper said. Yes, sir, now I believe I do recollect who tis. You some kin of his'n? No, the man said. No kin. Just something I got to see him about. He was dressed in clean gray chinos and had a neat felt hat tipped back on his head. Huffaker stole a look out the window to where his car was parked at the side of the porch, a plain black Ford, a late model. 
The man saw him look, watched the glint of suspicion narrow the storekeeper's eyes. Well, Huffaker said, I couldn't tell you offhand where all you might find him at. He lives up yander somewheres. A random gesture at the brooding hills that cupped in the valley. He trade here? The man wanted to know. Well, I couldn't rightly say he did, no, sir. Not regular at all. I ain't seen him in here but once or twice, and that's back several weeks ago. He's a right funny old feller. Don't have no money at all, I don't reckon. What did he buy, then? Well, he got him some backer and a sack of cornmeal. Little side meat last time he's in. He got credit? Well, no. I don't give out a whole lot of credit. He brings in sang. Ginseng roots. Had some golden seal, too, but it ain't worth a whole lot. I give trade on that. Roots? Yes, sir, Huffaker said. I send him off to St. Louis. Same place as I send hides. The man looked puzzled, but he didn't ask any more about that. You from around here? The storekeeper asked. From over towards Maryville. Oh, Huffaker said. I got Ken over there myself. He still got that dog? Who's that? The old feller. The one... Oh, yes, sir. Did have one with him. The old red bone looked like he'd been drugged half to death or washed in lye one. Didn't have no hair hardly at all. Right pitiful looking like. Well, the man said, you say you don't know where all he lives at? No, sir, I sure don't. Well, much obliged. Yes, sir. You come back. He did. He came every day for seven days. He was there next morning early among the unchurched Sunday idlers. Hovering on the edge of the circle, they formed about the fireless stove. Their conviviality so broken by his presence that they took on the look of refugees grimly awaiting bulletins of some current disaster, the news of flood or fire or plague. From time to time he got a drink from the box and stood sipping it hand on hip, gazing up at the phantasmagoria of merchandise hung about the ceiling beams, or peered solemnly out the window, beyond the river and the narrow bridge to where a broad green hollow rose and rose into the mountains. Monday, when Huffaker came down, he was not there yet. But half an hour later, when he went out to unlock the gas pump, the car was parked on the gravel ramp approaching the store, and the man was perched upon the fender in the same creased and tireless clothes, sipping coffee from a paper cup. The sun was coming up behind him, and to the west fog was breaking, lifting off the slopes to leave the laurel bulbs burning with the fierce green light of morning. The man was watching again, the peaks across the river, as if with those slate-gray eyes he might mark out an old man and a hound somewhere on the face of a mountain not less than four miles distant. When Huffaker let the door to, the man turned. He lifted a palm in greeting, and the man nodded. He went down to the pump and undid the lock. Looks like another pretty day, don't it? he called. Does it that? the man said. He drained the coffee and pitched the cup away, got down from the fender, and took a few steps up and down the gravel, stretching himself. Huffaker returned to the store. Around eleven o'clock he came in, nodding once again to the proprietor. He bought a box of soda crackers and some cheese, looked for a long time at the cake rack, and finally took a moon pie. He laid his lunch on the counter, and Huffaker began to total it laboriously on a scratch pad, adding the figures aloud. And a quart of sweet milk, the man said. He put that down, then went to the cooler and brought back the milk in a quart mason jar. The man looked at it, turned it around on the counter. That's Mrs. Walker's milk he reassured the man. It's good as you ever drunk. Guarantee ye. The man nodded and pulled a clip of bills from his pocket. Forty-five cents, Huffaker said. He paid it and went out on the porch where he sat back against a post and ate his lunch. After he had finished, he squatted there a long time smoking cigarettes. Then he brought the jar back inside and set it on the counter. Huffaker took it out again and washed it under the tap at the side of the building. Some customers were coming up toward the store, and he waved at them and went in. Later on in the afternoon, the man came in again and drank a Coca-Cola. Before he went back out to his car, he asked Huffaker what time it was that the old man usually came in. The old feller? The one I was asking you about. Oh. Well, times he come in, it was generally of a morning. But then he don't come regular enough for me to say when a feller be most likely to expect him. Light gained on the high peaks, and in the dawn quiet, first bird calls fell like water on stone. In the wood, mists like old gray spirits paled and scattered. By moss coverlets, the dark earth stirred, and night-furled wildflowers unbent their withered fronds all down the path, 
Where came the derelict hound shambling along in an aureole of its own incredibility? The old man picking his steps over the schist and quartz chines, his hex cane bobbing lightly on his shoulder, carrying a limp and greasy paper bag of the curious twisted roots with which he bartered. They crossed a broad rock slide emblazoned with sun and threaded by a trickle of water in a rock channel rusted copper dark. The old man paused to scale a slate down into the gorge where trees lay tossed and broken. The dog peered down, looked at the old man inquisitively, studied the empty gorge again, and then moved on, the old man taking up his cane and following. The sole of his brogan was all but off now, and he limped, favoring the odd shoe to save the binder twine with which he had tied it together. Crossing the slide, they entered the deep woods once more. The sun winnowed in tall fans among aspiring trunks, green, gold, and black vermiculated on the forest floor. With his cane, the old man felled regiments of Indian pipe, poked the green puffballs to see the smoke erupt in a poisonous, verdant cloud. The woods were damp with the early morning, and now and again he could hear the swish of a limb where a squirrel jumped and the beaded patter of water drops in the leaves. Twice they flushed mountain pheasants, scouts sidestepping nervously as they roared up out of the laurel. The path the old man took was a fire trail that had been built by the CCC. From the glade in which he now made his home, he had to climb nearly a thousand feet to reach it. But once on the trail, the walking was easy, and accepting the injured shoe, he would have swung along at a good pace. It was six miles to the river where he crossed and came to the highway and the same ubiquitous crossroads store with the drunken porch, the huge and rock-battered knee-high signs, the weather-curled laths, the paintless stone-colored wood. But the old man had taken an early start. Through a gap in the trees, he could see the valley far below him where the river ran, a cauldron in the mountain shadow where smoke and spume seethed like the old disturbance of the earth erupting once again. Black mist languid in the cuts and trenches, as flowing lava and the palisades of rock rising in the high-shored rim beyond the valley, and beyond the valley, circling the distant hoary cupolas now standing into morning, the sun, reaching to the slope where the old man rested, speared mist motes emblematic as snowflakes, and broke them down in spangled and regimental disorder, reached the trees and banded them in light, struck weftwork in the slow uncurling ferns, the sun in its long light fall recoined again in leaf water, Brogan and cane and cracked pad clatter and slide on the shelly rocks and stop where a snake lies curled belly up to the silent fold and dip of a petal burst of butterflies, fanning his flat and dead white underside. Scout smells cautiously at the snake, the butterflies in slow riot over his head, flowery benediction of their veined and harlequin wings. With his cane, the old man turns the snake, remarking the dusty carpet pattern of its dull skin, the black clot of blood where the rattles have been cut away. They go on, steps soft now in the rank humus earth, or where carapaced with lichens the texture of old green velvet, or wet and spongy earth tenoned with roots, the lecherous ganglia of things growing, coming down, pursuing the shadow line into the smoking river valley. Huffaker would have said it was by chance that he happened to be looking out the window toward the river the morning the old man came, but he had been watching not much less keenly than the patient and taciturn visitor in the pressed gray chinos. So he had been looking for him for a week, and there he was on the bridge with the crudely carved staff, carrying a small paper bag in his hand, a moldy croaker sack tied at his waist in front like an immense and disreputable sporan, and the wreckage of dog padding at his heels, raising its bitten muzzle into the air from time to time in a sort of hopeless and indomitable affirmation, proceeding on the weathered, sun-washed bridge, jaunty and yet sad, like maimed soldiers returning. Huffaker stepped to the door, and the man coming from the car with the slow boot crunch in the gravel shot him a quick look. Huffaker walked to the broken thermometer on the tin snuff sign at the corner of the store and pretended to check it, gazed at the mounting sun and sniffed at the air, went back in. The old man was on the road coming toward the store. The man was standing on the porch with one arm hooked loosely about a post, his forefinger in his watch pocket, chewing a straw slowly and watching his approach with the composed disinterest of a professional assassin. The old man climbed onto the porch, and the man said, Arthur Ownby? Arthur Ownby's eyes swam slowly across, fixed upon him. Yes, sir, he said. Get in that car over yonder. Let's go. The old man had stopped. He was looking at the man, and then he was looking past him, eyes milk blue and serene, studying the dipping passage of a dove, and beyond, across the canted fields of grass to the green mountain and to the thin blue peaks rising into the distant sky with no crest line of shape or color to stop them, ascending forever. You hear? The old man turned. 
You don't care if I trade first, do you? He said. You're under arrest. You don't need to trade nothing. The old man turned back toward the store with an empty gesture, holding the sack of ginseng in his hand. Let's go, the man said again. So he started down off the porch with a forlorn air, and the dog, bland, patient, turning behind him with myopic and near senseless habituation, until led by the man in the starched and rattling clothes, they reached the car. The man swung the door open, and the old man fumbled and climbed his way onto the front seat. As the door was closing, it began to occur to him that the dog was still out, and apparently not under arrest as he was, and he flailed violently at the glass and upholstery swinging toward him and checked it. The man looked at him questioningly. He didn't know how to begin, so he sat there for a part of a minute with his jaw going up and down as if he couldn't breathe, and the man said, Well, what now? The old man nodded his head to where in the gravel the ancient hound stood gazing up at the machine before him with a baffled look. What about him? the old man said. What about him? Well, you don't care if he rides, do you? You're resisting arrest, Zombie. Now get on in there. He slammed the door, but the old man's cane was hanging over the running board, and in mutual defeat, the door rocked open again as the cane cracked. The old man pulled it in the car with him and studied the lower part of it, stooping to examine the whiskers of wood standing up from the brake. The man slapped the door again, and it bounded in snugly upon the old man and all but took his breath. The man was coming around the car, and he hadn't much more time, so he pulled at the handles and got the right one and opened the door again, and leaned out and called to the dog, standing off a few feet now and rocking back and forth in consternation. Here, Scout, the old man whispered. Come on, get in here. Hey, the man called. What in the hell do you think you're up to now? The dog started, backed away. The man paused midway in his passage from door to door, returned. The old man straightened up and watched him come. I told you once, the man said, coming up fast and reaching for the door. The old man recoiled, waiting for it to buffet shut against him. But instead it wrenched outward, and the man's face jutted in and stared at him in a mask of classic anger. You trying to escape? He wanted to know. No, sir, the old man said. I was just getting my dog in. Just what? Dog! He turned and seemed to see the hound for the first time. They said you's crazy. Dog's ass. You can't take no dog. He can't shift for himself, the old man said. He's too old. I ain't no dog catcher, and this ain't no kennel, the man said. And I wasn't sent here to haul no broken down sooner around. Now get in the goddamned car and stay put. He said it very slowly and evenly, and the old man really began to worry. But he suffered the door closed to once more and didn't mention it again until the man came around and got in beside him. It wouldn't hurt nothing for him to ride, he said. I can't hardly leave him just to stand in there. Old timer, the man said. I advise you just to sit still and hush up, because you in plenty of trouble already. He cranked the engine and slid the gear shift upward, and the old man felt himself rocketed backward violently, with a welter of dust boiling and receding before him and the dog standing there in the drive with the gravel dancing about him. And then they cut one long rattling curve and were on the road and leaving. And the old man, clutching his cane, holding the dirty little sack between his knees, looked back at the dog still standing there like some atavistic symbol or brute herald of all questions ever pressed upon humanity, and beyond understanding, until the dog raised his head to clear the folds above his milky eyes and set out behind them at a staggering trot. Worn blue little cone-shaped thistles into the fur. No, he said. Tan, maybe. See here? He blew again. Cotton mink. Takes a first-class mink to bring twenty dollars. The boy nodded. Fur slipping, Warren said. Phew, here. He handed the mink back. Sure raised hell with it, didn't he? The boy took it and pitched it underhand back up onto the shelf in the woodshed. He clambered down the pile of logs and they went out together. Some wasps were hovering beneath the eaves with their long legs dangling. Small buds already on the locust trees. It would soon be nothing but bones, but he wouldn't come to see, like when he dug up the flying squirrel he had buried in a jar and found only bones with bits of fur rolling around inside the glass like bed lint. They took the road to Warren's house, the field still too wet to cross, past the store. You got any money? Warren asked him. No, he said. I ain't sold my hides yet. You? 
No. I sold my hides, but I ain't got nothing left. I blow it in quick as I get it. Got me some new shoes for school is about all. What you get for them? For the hides? I don't know. Two dollars on most of them. That big rat got three, I think it was, and some of them the man said was kits, and they didn't bring but a dollar. I had eighteen hides, and I think it come to thirty-one dollars. I should get six dollars, the boy said. I owe out, too. Who you owe? Silder. He loaned me the money for traps when Gifford got mine. I'd done signed a paper to buy him uptown. On account of the man let me have those first ones I bought at lot price. You keep messing with Silder and signing papers uptown and set shit as that. And you're going to get your ass slung in the jail after all. Lucky Gifford didn't do it. Gifford's chicken shit. Oh, Warren said. I didn't know you had him scared of you. Warren had his own room in the back of the house. The boy sat on the bed while he went through the top drawer of an old-fashioned sewing cabinet. He dredged up a hawkbill knife, three arrowheads, a collection of rifle balls velvety gray with oxidation, a scalpel, rocks, some dynamite caps, miscellaneous pieces of fishing tackle, dried ginseng, a roll of copper wire. Rifling through the mass, he at length came up with a thin and dog-eared pamphlet, its cover decorated with an archaic and ill-proportioned ink sketch of a trapped lynx. Across the top in black script was the title, Trapping the Fur Bearers of North America. Warren handled the treasure reverently. I got this from Uncle Ather, he said. It'll have something in it. Under a section entitled, They found a plan of such devious cunning as appealed to their minds. The bait was to be suspended from a limb and overhanging a stump. The trap would be set on top of the stump, so that when the victim stood, the illustration depicted a great hairy lynx sniffing at the bait on hind legs. His paw would come to rest on the stump and so into the trap, also illustrated in broken line, straining beneath a handful of leaves. Warren nodded in solemn approval. That's the one, he said. The boy studied the set carefully, and then Warren tucked the book away in the sewing cabinet. You reckon it really was a bobcat? I don't know what all else it could have been, Warren said. Ain't nothing else around here got sharp claws that I know of. I sure could have used that ten dollars, the boy said. The desk sergeant studied Marion Silder's angular frame with a hurt look, as if he were being put upon. Silder looked back at him with a suggestion of good humor. The desk sergeant rebent his head to his papers, his lips working in patient disgust. He pondered for some minutes, replaced a folder in the filing drawer of the desk, and reached for a pen. Mame, he said, gazing at the inkstand with weary boredom. Fred Long. Marion Paris Silder. Occupation? Iron and steel. None. Married? No. Married. Address? Red Mountain, Tennessee. Route 9, Knoxville. Mm. Age? 20. 8. Previous convictions? Silence. Previous convictions? The sergeant looked up at Silder as if surprised to see him there. Previous convictions, he said again, slowly. Again a moment or two of silence. Far to the rear of the building, a remote clanking sound. The sergeant waited. Then he nodded wearily to the patrolman sitting in a chair by the door. The man rose and sauntered over to the prisoner, something of the laconical about him. Silder turned to look at him. When he turned back to the man at the desk, the patrolman jabbed his nightstick into his ribs. Ow, Silder said. The patrolman looked aggrieved. Previous convictions, droned the sergeant, stifling a yawn. You seem to know all about it, Silder said. Oof. The patrolman studied his face with an eager look, holding the stick in readiness again. Previous con... None, Silder said. None. The sergeant leaned back with closed eyes, a rapt and serene look. The patrolman returned to his post at the door. From the cells to the rear of the building came bits and pieces of a sad voice singing. The sergeant turned papers over. In the outer corridor, men were coming in, stamping their feet and rattling their raincoats, cussing the weather. A furnace pipe clattered. At length, the sergeant regarded Silder again. I reckon that's all for now, he said. You're booked on illegal possession, untaxed. I got somebody coming down wants to see you. Have a little talk kindly. Who's that? Silder said. Fellow name of Gifford. Ever hear of him? Jailer!
Silter's third visitor was the boy, wide-eyed and serious before the smirking utterance of the jailer. Here's your uncle, the jailer said. Little buddy come a-callin'. The boy stared at the man seated on the steel bunk. The jailer followed his gaze. Well now, he said, he don't seem too pert, does he? Looks kinda like he's been sortin' cats. Step on in and say howdy. Cheer the poor feller up some. The boy stepped in. Silder's eyes focused onto him. He managed a small grin, a nod. Howdy there, hog jowls, he said. The door rattled to behind them, the jailer departing, heel clack, key jangle, echoing down the corridor. Howdy, said the boy. What happened to you? Well, I had a little disagreement with these fellers. As to whether a man can haul untaxed whiskey over tax-kept roads, or whether by not paying the whiskey tax he forfeits the privilege of driving over the roads the whiskey don't keep up, that ain't taxed, or if it was, would be illegal anyway. I think what they do is deport you. No, the boy said. I mean, you wreck? Oh, no. I was wrecked all right, but I didn't wreck. He fingered sorely the party-colored swellings on his cheek and forehead. Kindly a bang-up job, ain't it? Mutual acquaintance helped out with the decorating. The deacon Gifford. With two buddies to hold me. Wasn't even much spirited about it till I kicked him in the nuts. Now they got to worry about getting me unswole so as I can appear in court. I got some busted ribs, too, that they don't know about yet. I'm sort of holding them for a ace. Here, set down. He grimaced and dropped his feet down off the bed to clear a seat. The boy hadn't said anything else. He lowered himself onto the bunk, still staring at Silder. Then he said, That son of a bitch. Ah, said Silder. How'd they... You said you never wrecked. How did they... Catch me? It wasn't hard. I had my choice, though. I could have jumped off the bridge. They live ever once in a while. What? Water in the gas. A little too much rain, I reckon. Too much for old Eller's leaky-ass tank, leastways. There's one bill the son of a bitch will play hell collecting. It quit in the middle of the Henley Street Bridge. Oh. Silder had leaned back against the concrete wall and was tapping a cigarette from its package. Ain't that a hell of a note? He said. I'll get him. Hmm? I'm going to get the son of a bitch. What? That old fart? Why, I'll be dipped in... Then he said, Oh. That's right, the boy said. The deacon. The smile had fallen from Silder's face. Wait a minute, he said. You don't get nobody. Him, the boy said. No, Silder said. He was looking very hard at the boy, but the boy knew he was in the right. Why, he said. You just stay away from Jefferson Gifford, that's all. You hear? You just think I'll get in trouble, the boy said. That I... Stubborn little bastard, ain't you? Look... Silder paused. He seemed to be trying to think of something, a word, perhaps. Look, he said. What's between him and me is between him and me. It don't need nobody else. So I thank you kindly, but no thank you. You don't owe me nothing, and I ain't crippled. I'll tend to my own Giffords. All right? The boy didn't answer. didn't seem to be listening. Silder lit the cigarette and watched him. He turned and looked once at Silder, and then he seemed to remember something, and he reached into the watch pocket of his jeans and took out two folded dollar bills and handed them to him. What's that? Silder said. The two dollars I owe you, that you loaned me for traps. No, Silder started. Then he stopped and looked at the boy still holding out the two dirty bills. Okay, he said. He took the money and crammed it into his shirt pocket. Okay, that makes us square. The boy was silent for a minute. Then he said, No. No what? No, it don't make us square. Because maybe I lost the traps on your account, but that's okay. And I earned them back and paid for them, and that's okay. But you got beat up on my account, and maybe in jail too, that... And that's why it ain't square yet. That part of it not square. Silder started to reach for the money, thought better of it, and sat up, grinding the cigarette out beneath his heel. Then he looked at the boy. Where be damned, he said. I asked you to stay away from Gifford, that's all. Will you? The boy didn't say anything. Swear it, Silder said. No. Silder watched him, the still childish face set with truculent purpose. Look, 
he said. You're fixing to get me in worse trouble than I already am. You... I won't get no... No, wait a damn minute. He did. They sat looking at each other, the man's face misshapen as if bee stung. Him leaning forward, gaunt and huge, and the boy perched delicately on the edge of the metal pallet, as if loath to sit too easily where so many had lain in such hard rest. Look, Silder said, taking a long breath. You want to talk about square, all right. Me and Giff are square. The boy looked at him curiously. Yes, he said. I busted him and he busted me. That's fair, ain't it? The boy was still silent, calmly incredulous. No, Silder went on. I ain't forgetting about jail. You think because he arrested me that throws it off again, I reckon? I don't. It's his job. It's what he gets paid for, to arrest people that break the law. And I didn't just break the law. I made a living at it. He leaned forward and looked the boy in the face. More money in three hours than a working man makes in a week. Why is that? Because it's harder work? No. Because a man who makes a living doing something that has to get him in jail sooner or later has to be paid for the jail. Has to be paid in advance. Not just for his time breaking the law, but for the time he has to build when he gets caught at it. So I've been paid. Gifford's been paid. Nobody owes nobody. If it wasn't for Gifford, the law, I wouldn't have had the job I had blockading. And if it wasn't for me blockading, Gifford wouldn't have had his job arresting blockaders. Now who owes who? His voice was beginning to rise, and he had about him a look almost furious. But you, he went on, you want to be some kind of a goddamned hero. Well, I'll tell you, they ain't no more heroes. The boy seemed to shrink, his face flushing. You understand that? Silder said. I never claimed I wanted to be no hero, the boy said sullenly. Nobody never claimed it, Silder said. Anyway, I never done nothing on your account like you said. I don't do nothing I don't want to. You want to do me a favor? Just stay away from Gifford. Stay away from me, too. You ought not to have come here. You'll get me charged with delinquency to a minor. Go on now. He leaned back against the wall and stared at the emptiness before him. After a while, the boy got up and went to the door and tried it, and Silder, not looking up or speaking to the boy, called for the jailer. He heard him come and the clank of keys, the cell door grating open. Then quiet. He looked up. The boy was standing in the doorway, half-turned, looking at him with a wan smile, puzzled, like one who aspires to disbelief in the face of immutable fact. Silder lifted one hand in farewell. Then the door clanged to. He sat up, half rose from the cot, would call him back to say, That's not true what I said. It was a damned lie, ever word. He's a rogue and an outlaw himself, and you're welcome to shoot him, burn him down in his bed, any damned thing, because he's a traitor to boot, and maybe a man steals from greed or murders in anger. But he sells his own neighbors out for money, and it's few lie that deep in the pit, that far beyond the pale. Softly and with slow grace, her lettered footpads fell, hind tracking four with a precision profoundly feline, a silken movement where her shoulders rolled, haunches swayed, belly swaying slightly, too, lean but pendulous, head low and divorced of all but linear motion, as if fixed along an unseen rail. A faint musty odor still clung to her, odor of the outhouse where she had slept all day, restless in the heat and languishing among the dusty leaves in the corner, listening to the dry scratch and slither of roaches, the interstitial boring of wood beetles. Now she came down the patch, obscure with parched weeds, shedding thin blooms of sifting dust where she brushed them. At dusk dark from her degenerate habitation, emerging to make her way down the narrow patch as cats go. She passed through the honeysuckles by a dark tunnel where the earth still held moisture, down the bank to a culvert by which she crossed beneath the road and came into a field and into a dry gully, the cracked and curling clay like a paving of potsherds, and turned up an artery of the wash, grown here with milkweed and burdock, following a faint aura of vole or shrew until she came to a small burrow in the grasses. She scratched at the matted whorl, caved it in and trod it down, moved on across the field, cricket scuttling, grasshoppers springing from their weed stems and whirring away. A shadow passed soundlessly overhead, perhaps a flock of late-returning birds, Near the center of the field was a single walnut tree bedded in a crop of limestone which had so far fended it against axe and plowshare. 
Among these rocks she nosed in their small labyrinths undulant as a ferret. Odor of walnuts and ground squirrels. But she found nothing. When she left the rocks, was clear of the overreaching branches of the tree, there grew about her a shadow in the darkness like pooled ink spreading. A soft hissing feathered sound, which ceased even as she half turned, saw unbelieving the immense span of wings cupped downward, turned again, already squalling when the owl struck her back like a falling rock. Mr. Eller closed the lion-headed door behind him and rattled the latch to see that it was secure. Then he checked the plaited fob on the note case in his hip pocket, adjusted his straw hat, and started up the road toward the house. At the mailbox he was arrested by the high thin wail of a cat coming apparently from straight overhead. He looked up, but there were no trees there. He shook his head and went on, stepping carefully in the gutted drive. The squall sounded once more, this time more distant and to the ridge of pines behind the house. He continued on to the porch where a yellow bulb held forth its dull, steadfast light to a place of surcease. A young social worker recently retained by the Knox County Welfare Bureau, having been notified through his office of the detention of one aged and impecunious gentleman at the county jail pending hearing of his case, charges ranging from destruction of government property to assault with intent to kill, proceeded to make such investigation as would determine whether the gentleman had relatives and if not, to what department or agency he might properly be assigned as ward. The agent, having been admitted into the cell where the elderly gentleman was confined, addressed him. Mr. Ownby? Yes, sir. I represent the Welfare Bureau for the county. Welfare? Yes, we... You see, we help people. The old man turned that over in his mind. He didn't seem to be paying much attention to the thin young man standing just inside the door. He scratched his jaw, and then he said, Well, I ain't got nothing. I don't reckon I can help you any. The agent made a fleeting effort at comprehension, passed it over. All we need, he said, is some information. The old man turned and looked at him. You another policeman? he asked. No, said the agent. I represent the Welfare Bureau for... I have been asked to see you, to see if perhaps we can help you in any way. Well, the old man said... I kindly doubt it. I'm what you might call brushy-bound. Yes, said the agent. I mean, you see, Mr. Ownby, there are certain benefits to which you may be entitled. You seem to have been overlooked by our department for some time, and we would like to have a record of your case for our, our records, you see. And so I have some forms here that I need your help in filling out. Hmm, the old man said. Do you mind answering a few questions? Don't reckon, the old man said. Here, sit down. Thank you, said the agent. He lowered himself gingerly onto the cot and began to unstrap his briefcase. His hand disappeared inside and emerged with a sheaf of printed forms intershuffled with carbon paper. Now, he said comfortably, first of all, your age. Well, I don't rightly know. Yes. I beg your pardon? Don't know for sure, that is. There's a part of it I don't remember too good. Well, could you tell us when you were born? The old man eyed him curiously. If I know that, he said patiently, I could figure out how old I was. And tell us that. The agent smiled weakly. Yes, of course. Well, could you estimate your age, then? You are over sixty-five? Considerable. Well, about how old would you say? It ain't about, the old man said. It's either. Either eighty-three or eighty-four. The agent wrote that down on his form, studied it for a moment with satisfaction. Fine, he said. Now, where is your present residence? If and I'm 84, I'll live to be 105, providing I get to 85. Yes, your... When was you born? The agent looked up from his forms. 1913, he said. But we... What date? June, the 13th. Mr. Ownby... The old man tilted his eyes upward in reflection. Hmm, he said. That was a Friday. Kindly a bad start. Was your daddy over 28 when you was born? No, please, Mr. Ownby. These questions, you see... The old man hushed, and the agent sat watching him for a minute. Now, he said, your present address? Well, the old man said, I did live on Fork Creek, Twin Fork Road, but I moved to the mountains. I got me a little place up there. Where is that? That's all right where it's at. 
But we have to have an address, Mr. Ownby. Well, put down Twin Fork Road, then, the old man said. You live alone? Just me and Scout. Or we did. Scout? Dog. The agent continued to write. You have, I believe, no family or relatives? Yes, sir. The agent looked up. Well, he said, we'll need their names, then. I mean, yes, I don't have none, the old man said wearily. The agent continued with his questions, the old man answering yes or no or giving information. Upturned upon his knee, his right hand opened and closed with a kneading action, as though he were trying to soften something in his palm. Until at length it stopped and the old man sat upright, fist clenched and quivering and the veins like old blue thread imprinted in the paper skin, sat erect and cut the agent off with a question of his own. Why don't you say what you come here to say? Why not just up and ask me? I beg your pardon, said the agent. Why I done it? Wrung shells and shot your hoot nanny all to hell. Where are you from, eh? You talk like a goddamned Yankee. What you do for a living? Ask questions? Mr. Ownby, Mr. Ownby's ass. I could tell you why, and you spit wouldn't know. That's all right. You can set and ask a bunch of idiot questions. But not knowing a thing ain't never made it not so. Well, I'm an old man, and I've seen some hard times, so I don't reckon Brushy Mountain will be the worst place I was ever in. Mr. Ownby, I'm sure you're upset, and I assure you. Ah, said the old man. Mr. Ownby, there are only a few more questions. If you'd like, I could come back another time. I... We at the agency feel... I reckon you could, the old man said. I ain't going nowhere. He leaned back against the wall and passed one hand across his eyes, as if to wipe away some image. Then he sat very still with his hands on his knees, his shaggy head against the bricks, restored to patience and a look of tried and inviolate sanctity, the faded blue eyes looking out down the row of cages, a forest of sweating iron dowels, forms of men standing or huddled upon their pallets. And the old man felt the circle of years closing, the final increment of the curve returning him again to the inchoate, the prismatic flux of sound and color, wherein he had drifted once before and now beyond the world of men. By the time the agent had gathered his forms and tucked them once again into his briefcase, the old man had closed his eyes and the agent called quietly for the jailer and left him. The jailer walked with him down the corridor. The agent had regained his composure. Well, he said cheerily, he's a cantankerous old rascal, isn't he? The old feller? I reckon. Been pretty quiet here, but then they sure had a time getting him here. How's that? said the agent. Why, he shot four men. Luther Boyd stood hopping around on crutches. Did he kill anyone? the agent asked. No, but it wasn't from not trying. That old man's ornery enough. Yes, the agent said, musing. Definitely an anomic type. Mean as a snake, said the jailer. Here, watch the door. The agent thanked the desk sergeant as he passed through the outer room. He swung the briefcase to his left hand and dabbled his handkerchief upon his forehead. Over the worn runner on the flagged hall floor, his steps were soundless, and he moved with a slender grace of carriage, delicate and feline. In the spring of the year, you may see them about the grounds, walking or sitting, perhaps, in the wake and swath of the droning mowers lifting up strewn daisy heads, white and torn, softly fallen in the grass. Long monologues rise and fall, they speak of great deeds and men and noble eras gone. The mowers return along the fence in martial formation, drowning the babble of voices. The brick buildings atop the hill are dark with age, formidable yet sad, like old fortress ruins. Families come from the reception room into the pale sun, moving slowly, talking, grieving their silent griefs. The unvisited amble hurriedly about the grounds like questing setters, gesticulant and aimless. There are others who sit quietly and unattended in the grass, watching serene and childlike with serious eyes. Tender voices caress their ears endlessly, and they are beyond sorrow. Some wave hopefully to the passing cars of picnickers and bathers. The eldest of all sits a little apart, a grass stem revolving between his yellowed teeth, remembering in the summer. The mountain road brick red of dust, laced with lizard tracks, coming up through the peach orchard, Hot, windless, cloistral, in a silence of no birds, save one vulture hung in the smoke-blue void of the sunless mountainside, 
rocking on the high updrafts, and the road turning and gated with bull briars waxed and green, and the green cadaver grin sealed in the murky waters of the peach pit, slime green skull with newts coiled in the eye sockets and a wig of moss. The old man paused at the door, the attendant leading him by one arm through and into the room apparently against his will, peered at the boy through slotted lids as if unused to light of any intensity. He looked older than the boy remembered him. The attendant pulled him into the room, him shuffling in the old brogans with the paper-thin soles, a rasping sound on the concrete floor. They came over to where the boy sat. Here's your nephew, the attendant said loudly into the old man's ear. You remember him? The old man flashed a glint of blue eyes from deep beneath the closing lids. I reckon, he said. The attendant pushed him down into the wicker chair next to the boy and left them, going back through the door, high squeak of crepe diminishing in the corridor. The old man sat in his chair, staring across at the unrelieved spans of whitewashed plaster. Uncle Ather? He turned. The boy was holding at him a huge bag of chewing tobacco. I brought you some tobacco, he said. Beech nut, like you like. The old man took it from him slowly and slid it inside his shirt front. Thank you, son, he said. I'm much obliged. They sat quietly. The mowers passed again beneath the window, droning louder and then fading. Laughter and distant voices. Someone crying quite softly, like a child who is just lonely. Handily warming up a little, ain't it? The old man said. We had a little rain out to the mountain, the boy said. Sunday week, I believe it was. Yes, the old man said. Well, be little of it this year, I reckon. Done had it all at once. There's a good warm spell coming on. Won't nothing make, won't nothing keep. A seventh year is what it is. He gazed at the floor between his shoes. Out of the bell-flared tops, his shin bones rising hairless, pale and polished as shafts of driftwood, and into his trouser legs. Get older, he said. You don't need to count. You can read the signs. You can feel it in your own self. No, the blind man once could tell lots of things afore they happened. But it'll be hot and dry. Late frost is one sign if you don't know nothing else. So they won't but very little make because folks thinks that stuff grows by seasons, and it don't. It goes by weather. Game, too. And folks themselves, if they knowed it. I recollect one winter I was just a young feller. There wasn't no winter. Not hardly a frost, even. It was a sight in the world, the things that growed. That was a seventh year seventh. And you'll be as old as me before it comes again. The old man paused, consulted a trouser button. Then he said, I look for this to be a bad one. I look for real calamity afore this year is out. When the boy asked him, the old man explained that there was a lean year and a year of plenty every seven years. The boy thought about it. Then he said, That makes it ever fourteen year then, don't it? Well, said the old man, Depends on how you count, I reckon. If you count just the lean and not the plenty, or the other way around, I reckon you could call it ever fourteen year. I reckon some folks might figure that away. I call it the seventh my own self. He gazed at the wall above the line of wicker chairs. The attendant passed through the room with a young man and a woman. She was drying her eyes with a yellow lace handkerchief. They went out. After a while, the boy said, They got Marion Silder. The old man turned his head, the fine white silk of his hair lifting slightly with the motion as if a breeze had touched it. Who's that? He said. Silder, the... The feller used to haul whiskey for Hobie. They caught him with the load and sent him to Brushy. Thought his name was Jack, the old man said. No, Silder. Marion Silder. He was a friend of mine. Yes, the old man said. I recollect seeing him on the mountain time or two. Had a black car. Handly a new one, I believe it was. Say they sent him to Brushy. Three years. For running whiskey. That's pitiful, the old man said. Feller, nowadays you don't get by with much. Yes, I recollect the boy. Don't know as I ever did meet him. Well, I hope he fares better than me. I can't get used to all these here people. The old man looked like he might be going to say more. But he stopped and he looked at the boy, his wiry and tufted brows bunched, whether in pain or anger, and eyes blanched with age, a china blue, but fierce, a visage hoary and peregrine. 
How long do you have to stay in? Here, he said, looking about him. Likely a good while, son. They ain't never said what I was charged with, nor nothing, but I suspicion they think me light in the head is what it is. I reckon you know this was a place for crazy people. What they tend to do with me when they come to find out I ain't crazy, I couldn't speculate. He patted the front of his shirt where he had put the tobacco. How's young Pulliam, he said. He's gone up in the country to stay with his grandma, the boy said. Ain't nobody much left around no more. No, the old man said. You ever catch him a mink? No. I caught one, though. Did, eh? What did it bring? It never brought nothing. There was a bobcat or something got a hold of it and tore it up. That's a shame, said the old man. Did you lay you a set for that old cat? Me and Warren did. But we never caught nothing but a big old possum. Cats is smart, allowed the old man. Of course it could have been a common everyday house cat. They'll tear up anything they come up on, a cat will. House cats is smart, too. Smarter than a dog or a mule. Folks think they ain't on account of you can't learn them nothing. But what it is is that they won't learn nothing. They too smart. No the man once had a cat could talk. Him and this cat had talked back and forth of one another like airy two people. That's one cat I kept shy of. I knowed what it was. Lots of times that happens, a body dies and their soul takes up in a cat for a spell. Especially somebody drowned it or like that where they don't get buried proper. But not for no longer than seven years. So he would be gone now. And I don't have to fool with him no more, except he ought not to have got burnt. That ought not to have happened. And maybe I'd done wrong in that way to have let that happen. But it's done now and he's gone. That had to have been him Eller was supposed to have heard. Wondering what all it could have been squalling that away. Not that I'd have told anybody. Him leaving out cat and all and bound most probably for hell. And I hope they don't nobody hear no more from him never. So that man put him there either justified or not is free too afore God. Because after that seven year, they can't nobody bother you. What that lawyer said. And I had been scouting nine year, he said, was two year longer than needful. But this time I was too old and they catched me. Yes, he said. There's lots of things folks don't know about such as that. Cats is a mystery, always has been. He stopped, passed a hand across his face dreamily. Then he turned to the boy. Believe you've growed some, ain't you? He said. The boy ran his palms along his knees. I reckon, he said. Mm-hmm, the old man said. What do you figure you'll make? I don't know, he said. Not much of nothing. Well... The old man said, It's always hard for a young feller to get a start. It does seem like there's any number of ways to get money nowadays. Not like when I was growing up, cash money was right hard to come by. There's even a bounty on finding dead bodies. Man over to Knoxville does pretty good grapple hooking them when they jump off of the bridge like they do there all the time. They tell me he gets out fast enough to beat anybody else to him. Only not so fast as they might stit be a breathing. So they tell it leastways. But I never done it to benefit myself, because I knowed I'd have to scout the bushes if they found I'd done it as I allowed they would. And if I did have my reasons, did they can't a man say I'd done it to benefit myself? A man gets older, he said. He finds there's lots of things he can do just as well without. And so he don't have to worry about this and that the way a young feller will. I worked there all my life and never had nothing. Seems like an old man would be allowed to rest. But then he comes to find these things you have to do on account of nobody else wants to attend to them. Like that would make them go away. And maybe they don't look like much, but then they lead you around like you might start a rabbit dog to hunt a fence corner and get drug over half the county against nightfall. Which old man ain't good at no way. He eased himself slightly in the chair and shifted his weight. Most every man loves peace, he said. And none better than an old man or even knows they need attending to. But I never done it to benefit myself. Shot that thing. Like I kept peace for seven years, sake of a man I never knowed nor seen his face. And like I seen them fellers never had no business there. And if I couldn't run them off, I could anyway let them know they was one man would let on that he knowed what they was up to. But I knowed if they could build it, they could build it back, and I'd done it anyway. 
Every man loves peace, and the old man best of all. Do they allow you to chew in here? I kindly doubt it, the old man said. I ain't a fixin' to ask, no way. I'll just slip me one when I see clear to. They some in here I wouldn't put past telling on a feller. Half loonies. The real loonies wouldn't. Some here that ain't crazy like me, but I doubt they'd want to tell. I wonder how come them to be here, the boy said. The old man ran a lank and corded hand through his hair. I couldn't say, he said. The ways of these people is strange to me. I did mean to ask you. You ain't seen my old dog, I don't reckon. No, the boy said. I've not seen him. You want, I could go out to your place and hunt him. Well, every year out that way might holler for him. I don't know what to tell you to do with him. I ain't got no money to ask nobody to feed him with. And I couldn't shoot him, was he too poor to walk, but might could somebody else. I see him, I'll take care of him, the boy said. I wouldn't charge you nothing no way. Well, the old man said, refolding his hands in his lap. They looked up together and orderly crossing the room with prim steps and bearing in tow an odor of disinfectant, cleaning fluid redolent of sassafras from the corridor where two Negroes mopped backwards toward each other. They could hear the measured slap of the mops on the baseboard above the door's long pneumatic hiss until it closed and they sat again in quiet, the sunlight strong and airy in the room. That wasn't the one. He said, What are these? the stethoscope still about his neck and jerking about rubbery when he moved. Shotgun done it, said the old man, seated half-naked and in decorous rectitude upon the examining table with his feet just clearing the floor and looking straight ahead, so that the intern had moved him about roughly without speaking, either as you might a cataleptic, wasted thin with years, until the old man had asked him quietly if he intended to kill him. What were you doing, robbing a hen house? The old man didn't answer. He said again, I know she's here. If she is, she don't want to see you. I mean to see her. Then the barrel of the gun shortening and withdrawing in the cup of his shoulder, and his face bent to the stock and him walking into it, the black plume of smoke forming soundlessly about the muzzle, and the shot popping into his leg, audible and painless in his flesh, and him taking another step with the same leg and pitching forward as if he had stepped in a hole, and then he could hear the shot. You reckon you'll come back to the mountain, the boy said. When you come back? Oh, said the old man. Well, yes. Yes, most likely I will. I allowed I might go back up yander in the mountains where my new place is at. But I don't know as I will. A man gets lonesome off by himself. He ain't used to it. I expect I'll just come on back if the old house ain't fell down. Yes. He shuffled his feet on the floor. A shadow fell over them, and he looked up to see the boy standing. Are you leaving? he said. Yes, the boy said. I got to get on back. Well, I thank you for the tobacco. It's all right. Well, I'll come again. No, the old man said. Yes, I will. Well. He stopped again at the door and lifted his hand. The old man waved him on, and then he was alone again. The mowers came back. A little later, the attendant to lead him away. He stood in front of the courthouse again. Again, the heat and the sulfurous haze in fixed and breathless canopy above the traffic. He took the dollar from his pocket and pressed out the creases between his palms. It would leave him two dollars and what was left of the fifty cents, since he had gotten five and a half for the hides of which he had paid the two to Silder and now this dollar, which he hadn't even known that he owed. Then he climbed the walk, the dollar in his hand, past the arch and past the tireless bronze soldier, and under the new shade of the Buckeyes. He mounted the gritty, foot-worn steps upward in a rush into the hall, turning left and coming again to the long counter with the desks behind it. There was only one woman there, not the one he had traded with before. She was at a typewriter, the machine clacking loudly in the empty room. He stood at the counter watching her. After a while, he coughed. She stopped and looked up. Can I help you? she said. Yes, am She still sat, hands poised over the machine. He stared back at her. She lowered her hands into her lap, swiveled the chair about to face him. 
He said no more, and she rose and crossed slowly to the counter, adjusting her glasses as she went. Well, she said, what can I do for you? It's about the bounty, ma'am. Hawks. Oh, you have a hawk. She was looking down at him. No, ma'am, I done give it to you. He had the dollar out in his hand now and waving it feebly, wondering, could the price have gone up? I was figuring on trading back with you if you all don't care, he said. Her brows pinched up a small purse of flesh between them. Trade back, she said. You mean you want to get the hawk back? Yes, am he said. If you all don't care. When did you bring it in? He looked to the ceiling back again. Let's see, he said. I believe it was around in August, but it could have been early in September, I reckon. Say, Lord God, son, the woman said. It wouldn't still be here. Last August. Why, what all do you do with them? He asked, somehow figuring still that they must be kept, must have some value or use commensurate with a dollar other than the fact of their demise. Burn them in the furnace, I would reckon, she said. They sure can't keep them around here. They might get a little strong after a while, mightn't they? Burn them, he said. They burn them? I believe so, she said. He looked about him vaguely, back to her, still not leaning on nor touching the counter. And throw people in jail and beat up on them. What? She said, leaning forward. An old man in the crazy house. Son, I'm busy. Now, if there was anything else you wanted... He smoothed the dollar in his hand again, made a few tentative thrusts, pushed it finally across the counter to her. Here, he said. It's okay. I can't take no dollar. I made a mistake. He wasn't for sale. He turned and started for the door. You, she called. Here, you come back here. You can't... But that was all he heard, through the door now, running down the long hall toward the wide-flung outer doors, where a breeze riffled the posters and notices on the wall, and past them and again into the candent May noon. The boy had already gone when they came from Knoxville, seven years now after the burial and seven months after the cremation, and sifted the ashes since whipped to a broth by the rains of that spring and now dried again, caked and crusted. Sifted them and there found the chalked sticks and shards of bone gray-white and brittle as ash themselves, and the skull worm-riddled, vermiculate with a tracery of them and hollowed and fired to the weight and tensile cohesiveness of parched cardboard, the carried teeth rattling in their sockets, and a zipper of brass fused shapeless, thick-coated with a dull green paste. That was all. They were there four hours, the two officers, deferential before the coroner, dusting the pieces with their handkerchiefs and passing them on to him, who placed them in a clean bag of white canvas. Mr. Eller bit with his small teeth a piece from his plug of spiced tobacco, refolded the cellophane and put it again into his breast pocket. And the skull, he said, with all the felons melted out of the teeth. Okay, and the skull. Johnny Romines stopped the cigarette half-rolled in his left hand and leaking as he gestured with it. So, he said, what I want to know is did the boy know about it or not, and would he know was it his daddy? I don't know, Mr. Eller said. If he did, I never heard it. Besides, he's been gone off now since May or June, and this is the fourth day of August. They're just now getting up there. I figure maybe the old man was the only one that knowed. Old man owned me? Was he the one done it? No, Mr. Eller said. Of course, they're liable to throw it off on him to save hunting somebody else. But he was the one told it? Near as I can find out, he was. Johnny Romines passed the paper across his tongue and folded it shut. Well, do you reckon it was him? He said. His daddy, you mean? Room for speculating there, too, I reckon. Miss Ratner claims that it was, and that the boy has gone off to hunt whoever it was put him there. She says it all come to her in a dream. A vision, she called it. Wonder if she had a vision about him being wanted in three states, Gifford said. Mr. Eller turned on the constable. No, he said. I doubt she has. I don't reckon she needs any such either. She's a good Christian woman, don't matter who all she might have been married to and not knowed no better. The constable looked at the storekeeper. Or the boy either, Mr. Eller added. Never you mind about the boy. Gifford said. Me and him is due for a nice little talk, anyway. Well, you'll have to find him first. 
Wonder who it was, Johnny Romine said. That put him in there, I mean. Reckon it was somebody from around here? I doubt it was somebody from New York City, the constable said. He turned to Mr. Eller. And what about that fancy plate he was supposed to have? In his head from the war. Well, what about it? Well, there wasn't none. How she account for that? I don't reckon she ever thought to ask about it. She just never would have doubted or wondered about it in the first place. About whether he had one, if he said he did, or about whether that was him in that ditty bag, if she'd decided that it was either one. Mr. Eller rolled his cheeks and spat soundlessly across the constable's bow and into a coffee can. Seems like you ought to tell your sidekick about it, though, he said. Who's that? Legwater. He ain't my sidekick, Gifford said. And I don't have to tell nobody nothing except as I see fit. Mr. Eller studied a passing fly, apparently ruminating on some obscure problem in the dynamics of flight. Well, he said agreeably, I reckon you're right. Keep him out of mischief, anyhow. Gifford's eyes narrowed suspiciously. What? What will? Camping up on the mountain, with his shovel and his window screen. Some coughs went their rounds. A milk case settled floorward creakily. Humph, said Gifford, unleaning from the counter with studied ease. He fingered cigarettes deftly from one straining pocket. Then, what's he doing up there? Mr. Eller waited while the match rocketed across the counter. Then he said, Hunt and plat him of my reckon. Lesson he's sifting them ashes for to make soap. Legwater was on the mountain three days before anyone could get close enough to him to tell him it wasn't so, that the man never had any platinum in his head, and that he was wasting his time. It was all a mistake. The first night he built his fire and was sitting by it with his shotgun leaning against a tree and was sipping coffee from a canteen cup when the hound staggered into the clearing on the far side of the fire and stood with his blind head swinging back and forth like a bear's, muzzle up to catch what clue the wind might bring. Ha! cried Legwater, leaping up, the coffee flying. Ha! he said, stepped to the tree and snatched up the shotgun. But before he could get a proper sight, the dog was gone again, absorbed quietly into the darkness. Legwater leveled the gun at the night and fired, listened after the compounding echoes of the shot for a long time, and then stepped to the fire and got the cup and poured it full from the pot, squatting, the shotgun leaning against his knee. He listened some more, but could make nothing out. He set the pot back on the little circle of stones he had constructed and tried the hot rim of the cup against his lip. The hound did not reappear. When he had finished the coffee, he rolled his blankets out, reloaded the empty chamber of the gun, and settled for sleep. Toward early morning, he woke, sat up quickly, and looked about him. It was still dark, and the fire had long since died. Still dark and quiet with that silence that seems to be of itself listening, an astral quiet, where planets collide soundlessly beyond the auricular dimension altogether. He listened. Above the black ranks of trees, the midsummer sky arched cloudless and coldly starred. He lay back and stared at it, and after a while he slept. When he woke again, the sun was up. He was still lying on his back, and now in the depthless blue void above him a hawk wheeled. He got to his feet and began to walk around, feeling stiff and poorly rested. He scouted in the woods and came back with a load of dead limbs, snapped them to length under his foot, and soon had a fire going and coffee warming. When it had perked, he sat blowing at a cupful and shifting it from hand to hand, as it got too hot, or he found a new mosquito bite to scratch at. There was an army rucksack hanging from the tree near his blankets, and from the pocket he took some cold biscuits and ate them. Then he got to work. The ashes in the pit were better than a foot deep, and the ground all about was strewn with them. He worked all day, shoveling out piles of ash, and then climbing from the pit to sift them with his window screen. Late in the afternoon, some boys came into the clearing and stood for a time watching him. He kept at it, the clouds of ash billowing up out of the pit. Before long, they began to comment. He looked at them sharply, not stopping, sifting the ashes, examining charred bits of cedar wood. Soon they were giggling among themselves. He ignored them, adopting an official air about his work. It was no good. Might be gold teeth, too, one of them sang out. A flurry of titter surged and died. Legwater stood up and glared at them. They were five, standing together just at the edge of the trees with grinning faces. He climbed back into the pit with his shovel. 
From time to time he would stretch his head up over the top of the hole to see what they were about. But about the third time one of them gobbled like a turkey, and they all howled with laughter, so he gave it up and tried not to look their way. He kept at his shoveling. After a while he heard something clatter near the pit. He looked up and the boys had gone. Then an apple dropped into the ashes at his feet with a soft puff. He stopped and craned his neck up. Sure enough, here came another. He marked its course, leaped out of the pit, and seizing the shotgun as he went, began a fast walk in the direction from which the apple had come. Brush began crashing. A voice called, Run, fellers, run! He'll shoot you down and scalp you! Another, You got silver in your teeth, you're a dead un. He stopped. The sounds died away. On the road further down the mountain, high laughter, cat calls. He went back to work. By nightfall, he was a feathery gray effigy, face, hair, and clothing a single color. He spat gobs of streaky gray phlegm. Even the trees near the pit had begun to take on a pale and weathered look. The hound came back after dark. He could hear it padding in the leaves, stop, shuffle again. He had eaten the last of what food he had brought and could hardly sleep for the cramping in his belly. He held the shotgun and waited for the hound to enter the firelight. It did not. Finally, he went to sleep with the shotgun lying across his lap. He was very tired. When he went to the pit the following morning, the first thing he saw was an old goat skull, the brain pan crammed with tinfoil. He pitched it away in disgust and fell to shoveling. By late in the afternoon, his hunger had subsided and he had cleared the pit so that in one end the bare concrete was visible, blackened and encrusted with an indefinable burnt substance that scaled away under the shovel and showed green beneath. He was shoveling faster, approaching desperation as the residue of unsifted ashes diminished, when Gifford showed up, badly winded from his climb up the mountain. Legwater stopped and watched him come across the little clearing, his shoes weighted with clay, his face inflamed with a red scowl. When he got to the pit, Legwater leaned on the shovel and looked up at him. Well, he said, you want shares, I reckon? After I done... Idget, Gifford said. God damn, what a idiot. He was standing on the concrete rim now, looking down at the humane officer, gaunt and fantastically powdered with ash, and looking at the great heaps of ashes and the screen, the bedroll, rucksack, shotgun. You think so? Legwater said. I know so. He wasn't no war hero. It ain't for sure it was even him, but if it was, he never had no, no thing in his head. I'll be the judge of that, Legwater said, bending with his shovel. Gifford watched him, moving around to the upwind side to keep clear of the dust. In a few minutes, the humane officer leaped from the pit and began shoveling the new ashes onto the screen, then shaking it back and forth to sift them through. A fevered look in his eye like some wild spotomantic sage, divining in driven haste the fate of whole galaxies against their imminent ruin. The constable lit a cigarette and leaned back against a tree. Legwater threw out two more piles of ash and sifted them, and then, when he disappeared into the pit again... Gifford could hear him scraping around, but not shoveling. He ventured over and peered in. Legwater was on hands and knees, going over the scraped floor of the pit carefully, scratching here and there with the tip of the shovel. Finally, he stopped and looked up. The little bastard was lying, he said. He got it his own self, the lying little son of a bitch. Let's go, Earl. His own daddy, the humane officer was saying. Gifford started toward the road with long, disgusted strides. When he got to the apple trees, he turned and looked back. Legwater was standing in the pit, just his head showing, staring vacantly. Well, said the constable. He kept staring. Hey, Gifford called. Legwater turned his head to give him a dumb look, the incredulous and empty expression, common to victims of tragedy, disaster, and loss. You want to ride or not? He pulled himself from the pit and began walking toward the constable. Then he was hurrying, loping along, the shovel still in his hand and bouncing behind him. Gifford let him get all the way to him before he sent him back after the shotgun and the camping gear. They went down the orchard road together, their steps padding in the red dust, the constable swaggering slightly as he did, and the humane officer, haggard-looking, his black and sleepless eyes all but smoking, grimly apparitional with the shotgun and the spade dangling one at either side from his gaunt claws. Gifford carried the other's rucksack and blanket roll with light effort, and from time to time he sidled his eyes to study Legwater with pity or with contempt. 
Neither spoke until they saw the dog, and that was very near to the pike, on the last turn above the gate. They had overtaken it, and even in the few minutes in which he was allowed to watch it alive, Gifford was struck by its behavior. It was walking in the wheel ruts with an exotic delicacy, like a trained dog on a rope, and holding its head so far back, its nose near perpendicular, that Gifford looked up instinctively to see what threat might be materializing out of the sky. The shovel bounced in the road with a dull bong, and when he turned it was in time only to see Legwater recoil under the shotgun and to recoil himself as the muzzle blast roared in his ears. He spun and saw the dog lurch forward, still holding up its head, slew sideways and fold up in the dust of the road. The few small windows were glassless but for a jagged side or corner still wedged in a handmade sashes. The roof shakes lay in windrows on the broad loft floors, and this house housed only the winds. Dervishes of leaves rattled across the yard, and in the wind the oaks dipped and creaked, and in the wind even the spavined house hung between the stone chimneys seemed to give a little. The doors stood open and wind scurried in the parlor, riffled the drift leaves on the kitchen floor, and stirred the cobwebbed window corners. He did not go to the loft. The lower rooms were dusty and barren and but for some half-familiar rags of clothes altogether strange. He came back into the yard and sat quietly for a while beneath one of the trees, watched a water bird skim beneath the shadow line of the mountain, cupped wings catching the slant light of the sun, then holding the wide curve in a wing-set sweep low over the trees to the pond, homing to the warm black waters. He watched it down. What caught his ear? The high, thin wicker of a feather, a shadow passing, nothing. Light was breaking in thin reefs through the clouds shelved darkly up the west. Old dry leaves rattled frail and withered as old voices, trailed stiffly down, rocking like thin-worn shells downward through seawater, or spun curling ancient parchments on which no message at all appeared. Young Ratner finished his cigarette and went back out to the road. An aged negro passed high on the seat of a wagon, dozing to the chop of the half-shod mule hooves on the buckled asphalt. About him the tall wheels veered and dished in the erratic parabolas of spun coins, unspinning as if not attached to the wagon at all, but merely rolling there in that quadratic symmetry by pure chance. He crossed the road to give them leeway, and they swung by slowly, laboriously, as if under the weight of some singular and unreasonable gravity. The ruined and ragged mule, the wagon, the man. Up the road they wobbled, rattled and squeak of the fellies climbing loose over the spokes. Shimmered in waves of heat rising from the road, dissolved in a pale and broken image. He followed along behind, going toward the forks. Once at the top of the hill he paused and looked back, and he could see the roof of the house deep green with moss, or gaping black where patches had caved through. But it was never his house anyway. Evening. The dead sheathed in the earth's crust and turning the slow diurnal of the earth's wheel at peace with eclipse, asteroid, the dusty novi, their bones brittled with mold and the celled marrow going to frail stone, turning, their fingers laced with roots, at one with Tut and Agamemnon, with the seed and the unborn. It was like having your name in the paper, he thought, reading the inscription. Mildred Yearwood Ratner, 1906 to 1945. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry it all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. Exodus. The stone arrogating to itself in these three short years already a gray and timeless aspect, glazed with lichens and nets of small brown runners, the ring of rusted wire leaning awry against it with its stained and crumpled rags of foliage. He reached out and patted the stone softly, a gesture as if perhaps to conjure up some image, evoke again some allegiance with a name, a place, hallucinated recollections in which faces merged inextricably, and yet true and fixed, touched it, a carved stone less real than the smell of wood smoke or the taste of an old man's wine and he no longer cared to tell which were things done and which dreamt. His trouser legs were wet and clammy against his ankles. Sitting on the small square of marble, he removed one shoe, testing the sock for dampness, resting as any traveler might. From across the tall grass and beyond the ruins of the spiked iron fence came the click of the light box at the intersection. A car emerged from the trees at his right and rolled to a stop. There were a man and a woman, she looked at him across the man's shoulder, then turned to the man. They both looked. The box clicked. He waved to them, and the man turned, 
saw the green light and pulled away, the white oval of the woman's face still watching him. So he waved again to her just as the car slid from sight behind a hedgerow, the wheels whisking up a fine spray from the road. He sat there for a while, rubbing his foot abstractedly, whistling softly to himself. To the west, a solid sheet of overcast sped the evening on. Already fireflies were about. He put on his shoe and rose and began moving toward the fence through the wet grass. The workers had gone, leaving behind their wood dust and chips, the white face of the stump pooling the last light out of the gathering dusk. The sun broke through the final shelf of clouds and bathed for a moment the dripping trees with blood, tinted the stones a diaphanous wash of color, as if the very air had gone to wine. He passed through the gap in the fence, past the torn iron palings, and out to the western road, the rain still mizzling softly and the darkening headlands drawing off the day, heraldic, pennant in flame, the fleeing minions scattering their shadows in the wake of the sun. They are gone now, fled, banished in death or exile, lost, undone. Over the land, sun and wind still move to burn and sway the trees, the grasses. No avatar, no scion, no vestige of that people remains. On the lips of the strange race that now dwells there, their names are myth, legend, dust. End of The Orchard Keeper by Cormac McCarthy